Okay, good morning everyone. We're continuing in this beautiful Sefer, Rosa the Shabbos, the secret of Shabbos. We are now on page Yud Beis. I decided I'm getting tired of photocopying so, because I give this class today and I give it Shabbos morning. So I bought 15 copies, they'll be delivered so people can uh, use, either purchase the book and own the book or use it, whatever, this way we don't have to keep making photocopies, it's going to get more expensive that way. The book is only, well, $17 plus shipping, so it yeah. can't be more than $20, $22. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to discuss the topic for in this essay is Tfilas Shabbos, the Shabbos prayers. However, he doesn't get around to it till the end. So we're going to talk about a lot of other things in this essay. Till we'll find it. Okay, so uh, we're going to not, I don't think we're going to finish it today. And then unfortunately the next time we're going to get together will be after Pesach. Okay, this will be the last class till after Pesach. Uh, next Tuesday we still have a Parsha class. Still have a Parsha class. So uh, we'll have to remember what we're learning here. But we'll get enough in today to get one very important idea. Where we're going to learn a lot more about the idea of eating some of the Shabbos food on Erev Shabbos, which we've talked about. Now we're going to get a deeper insight. Tomorrow, everybody's going to make sure to eat a little bit of the cholent, a little bit of the kugel before Shabbos. And we're going to, yeah. it, it's going to be, I've been telling you this all the time. <laughs> That's right, but we're going to get a deeper reason why we do this. So it's, there's three um, concepts he brings out over here, and it's going to lay the groundwork for the entire essay here. Kosov Ramban, the Ramban, famous Ramban in Parshas Yisrael, on his commentary on the Shabbos, Ala pasuk zochar es yoyim hashabbos lekacho. Remember the Shabbos to sanctify it. So Ramban says, Agar shidiber alzad hahalacha de zochar. After he speaks about the halachic aspect of the word zohar, what did God mean when he said, remember the Shabbos? Hu mitzvahs ase. That's referring to the positive aspects of Shabbos. There are positive things you do on Shabbos, like making Kiddush. That's a positive mitzvah. We learned that from this word, zohar es yoyim. Remember the Shabbos, mention the Shabbos. So it's more than just remembering it. It's applying to all the positive aspects of Shabbos. For Shamor, and when it says in the second tablets, Shamor, to guard the Shabbos, what's it really referring to? He mitzvahs laosase. It's referring to the negative aspects. Don't work. Don't do the 39 prohibited activities. Umikom makam, still in all, Belukas Rishonas Kasav Zohar of Shamar. Even though in the first tablets it says Zohar, which implies the positive mitzvahs. And the second tablets it says Shomar, which implies the negative ones. Ain't a stira chas vashom, it's not a contradiction. And more we know the rabbis say, Ubadibur Echod Nemru. They were said together at the same time. When, when Hashem at Sinai told us the fourth commandment of Shabbos, something we can't understand how that could happen. God said the words Zohar and Shomar at the same time as if there were two loudspeakers in his mouth. Zohar at the same time. So now that's what the Ramban says. So then, Himshich Leva'er Aldas Avodas Anafesh. So now we have to continue to explain based on the service of the soul. What does this mean on a deeper level? So it means the Kosav, and he writes, the Zohar Shu Mitzvah Sase, who Yotze Mimidas Ha'am. Zohar, which reflects on positive mitzvahs, that emanates from the attribute of love. Because when you love someone, you do things for someone. Right? When you actually do something, that comes from love. Vishomar, but when you're guarding, Shulosa say, which is we don't do things, that comes from Midas Yira, that comes from the attribute of fear. I don't insult my wife, because I'm afraid to insult my wife. I have awe for my wife, I have reverence for my wife. I love my wife, I give her a gift. 
So, so that, that's the way it is. And the truth of the matter, matter is, the chol masa mitzvah, any positive action of a mitzvah, humach mas ava, shereitz liskarva levisparach. It comes from a love that wants you to get closer to Hashem. Vachol shmiras mitzvah slos hashem, whenever you care, you're careful not to transgress a negative commandment. Hu yira milavar al mitzvah isbarach. He's afraid to transgress Hashem's mitzvahs. Those are two different forces from the soul. And it really motivates all human behavior in their service for Hashem. And that is implanted in us to help a person to help us to do the positive mitzvahs and not to transgress the negative ones. He's saying a very important idea. There are two primary forces within the human being. And, you know, this mystical term is the same thing. Chesed, Gvura. From the seven lower spheres, you have Chesed, kindness. Gvura is control. Same idea. Chesed really means love. Ava, when you're kind, you're loving, you're doing things, you're expressing, you're expanding yourself. And Gvura, control, is ira, fear. I'm, I don't want to do the things I shouldn't be doing. I'm afraid to hurt my relationship with Hashem. So the truth of the matter is, everything you do, from when you wake up till you go to sleep, really comes from those two primary forces. The force of kindness and love, or the force of control and fear. Think about what you do. Everything else, he says, any other force and nature a person exhibits, him sniffing because they're branches from those main forces. The Torah only has positive commandments and negative commandments. You don't need any primary strengths. Everything else emanates from that. Humility, consistency, all those things, they are branches from the roots. But central to everything we do Whatever do, either it's motivated out of a sense of love or out of a sense of fear. Everything, everything you do, everything you do. That's the famous Rambam. That's the famous Rambam. Now, the, uh, the Tzaddik is going to analyze over here with Weintraub. He's going to analyze how this really, and why is this said by Shabbos? So he says, the Hayos. These two forces is what drive a person to fulfill all the mitzvahs of the Torah. We already explained the Shabbos. What happens on Shabbos? A person is elevated to live a soulful existence. Where we are less inclined to follow the body's nature. That's what Shabbos is all about. It's a soulfully enriched experience. Imkain must be based kochos elu, these two forces of love and fear. Bivadai misraim and b'shabbos certainly get elevated on Shabbos as well. In other words, a whole week long, we're supposed to do things out of a sense of love or to not do things out of a sense of fear. This also explains a very interesting halacha. What do you do if a situation arises where simultaneously, if I do a positive mitzvah, I would transgress a negative one? What do you do? What do you do? Let's say it's a mitzvah to put on tzitzis. Mitzvah to put on tzitzis. Tzitzis have to be made out of wool. What if I have a four-cornered linen, linen garment? Is there a mitzvah to put tzitzis on my linen garment? Well, wait a minute. If I put tzitzis on my linen garment, I'm creating a negative avera of shatnes, a forbidden mixture of wool and linen. So what do I do? Do I not put on the tzitzis and not transgress shatnes? Or do I, yes, put on the tzitzis and transgress shatnes, but at least get a mitzvah? So we have a principle, ase doche lo sase. A positive mitzvah pushes away a negative mitzvah. If you have the opportunity to do a mitzvah, and in the course of that mitzvah, you have no choice. Now, when there's a choice, obviously, you shouldn't transgress, obviously. But this four-cornered 
linen garment must have scissors. And I don't have any linen scissors. So I've got wool scissors. You put the wool scissors on and you fulfill the mitzvah. Why? Why is one better than the other? The answer is better to do something to show your love than something to show your fear of Hashem. That's the rule. You get more out of showing your love than just showing your fear. So you wear the ticket to the It's this. But you don't put the Forget about anything else. I'm just saying that mitzvah of, of tzitzit, I'm just giving you one example where the positive pushes off the negative. Don't worry about the negative. Remember, all you want to do is the will of God. The only reason we're doing mitzvahs is to do the will of God. So God has two conflicting wills. <laughs> one will is put tzitzit on, one will is not to put on shamas. But I, but I, but I, can't, I can't, something's got to give. So what gives? What gives is love is always better, a better way of showing your connection to Hashem than fear. So a whole week long, we have within ourselves a power that enables us to show that love when we do certain mitzvahs. You, you know, the, the Rambam has one of his 14 books in Yad Chazaka. One of them is called the Book of Ava, the Book of Love. And what laws are in the Book of Love? Sitzes, tefillin, davening, brachas. Those are things that are in the book of love. Why? Because those are positive mitzvahs that we do. You want to show God you love him? Get up early in the morning, daven in a minion, learn some Torah, do those kinds of things, make brachas on food. Those are positive mitzvahs. It shows that you love him. So every one of us has a certain degree of that power to show that during the week. And as well, we have to have fear and we have to resist doing certain Averos. But on Shabbos, when we are more connected to our soul, these two forces that are soulful forces are even stronger. The ability for me to show love on Shabbos is stronger because I'm not so connected to my body. So that pure soulful power of love can be expressed even more. And the soulful feeling of fear Awe can be expressed even more on Shams. But now he says something amazing. So number one, see, see, so whatever you do during the week, it should be easier to do it on Shams. If you find it challenging to go to shul during the week, but you're going, it should be easier for you to go to shul on Shams. Easier to learn Torah on Shams. Easier to make brachas on Shams. There's more power. But there's another amazing thing. During the week, there are two different feelings, love and fear, and they're in two different compartments. One part of my brain shows my love, one part of my brain shows my fear, but the two don't really mingle with each other during the week. Because love is a movement of closeness. If I want to show I love somebody, what do I do? I go closer to them. Literally or figuratively. If, I, if you like somebody, you like to stand next to them, don't you? Somebody you really like. You're at a wedding with your spouse. You love your spouse, so you like to hang around your spouse. You can tell when people don't like each other. They stay far apart from you. You ever go to a wedding and there's somebody you really didn't like? Really don't like that person? You're going to be on one side, that person's going to be on the other side of the room. Because you want to stay far away from somebody you don't like. Somebody you fear. Let's say uh, you're behind in your payments to the loan shark. <laughs> you stay very far away from that guy. Those are opposite feelings. When you love someone, it's a feeling of, I want to be closer to you. And therefore, I will do something for you. Let's that's, that's, that's get close. Fear is whoa. I have to stay away. Let's say, let's say a fear for a, a king. Same idea. I, I can't be so chummy with him. I can't be buddy-buddy with him. Put my hand around the king and say, oh, I, I, I palsy walsy Move back. You have to show fear. Those are contradictory movements, contradictory feelings. Love here, fear there. And during the week, never the two meet. But listen here. Not only do these powers get stronger... <laughs> Mikomokam Bishabbos, remember. Remember, now let's get this straight. 
There's an idea of love and fear in every aspect of Yiddishkeit. Every aspect of Yiddishkeit is an aspect of love and fear. No matter what the mitzvah is, there's an aspect of showing my love to Hashem and my fear to Hashem. Putting on tzitzis shows my love for Hashem. Um, not speaking Lashon Hara shows my fear for Hashem. So I stay away from it. The two don't come together. That's all mitzvahs. But now there's one mitzvah called Shabbos. And Shabbos, Shomar and Zohar were said at the same time. And Shomar we said is what? Zohar is the positive aspect of Shabbos. The part that shows that I love Hashem. What do I do on Shabbos to show that I love Hashem? That I want to be close to Hashem? And then there's a part of Shabbos that's called Shomar. You have to be careful. You can't, you can't do this work. You can't do these 39 activities. Stay away. It's moksha. Stay away. Oh, I'm afraid. I don't, want to, I don't want to touch it. So these powers on Shabbos, number one, because it's Shabbos, get stronger. But also, it says specifically and only by Shabbos, Shomar v'zachar b'dibur echad. Love and fear were said in the same time. So, although during the week, when I show my love, I can't show my fear. When I show my fear, I can't show my love because they're opposites. Listen to this. They were said at the same time. And what happens is, and this is something we, we touched on in the Parsha class last Tuesday. Did, remember we talked about in the idea of the Megillah, there's lots of opposites. Hodu and Kush. We said, Tipesh, Chacham, you know, uh, Mordechai, Haman, opposites. And in our world, opposites can't be brought together. And we said, Purim, the magic of Purim is they bring the opposites together. Well, the same idea is by Shabbos. That by Shabbos, Shomor v'Zochor, love and fear, those are opposites. Love and fear are opposites. But on Shabbos, the Dibur Echot, they're said simultaneously. And what happens is that Bepanim Chadosh love has a new face on Shabbos. Fear has a new face on Shabbos. Ein Bahem Stirachwal. There's no contradiction between love and fear. It's a mind boggling concept here. On Shabbos, two things happen to your standard a whole week long. You either do things that show you love Hashem, you do things that show you fear Hashem, but you can't combine the two because they're opposites. One is getting close and one is going far away. Shabbos, because we are living a soulful experience, these two powers are stronger, they get higher, and because they're higher, there's a new way of manifesting themselves in a way that can be totally at one. That's what it means, Shomer V'Zochar B'Di Echad. My service to Hashem is totally complete. There's no conflict even within my service to Hashem. Now, this is a deep idea. We have to uh, elaborate on this more. That's what this Shmu is going to elaborate on. And you'll see exactly what this means. But this is point number one, which has to be explained. But it, it's very hard to hold both. Just like we said, Avram represented love. Yitzhak represented control. Right? Everything Avram did was through the lens of love. Everything Yitzhak did was through the lens of control. Totally two different personalities. Avram's running to people, showering his love upon people. That's, that's a certain personality type. The other personality type says, no, you, know, you just don't take everything. You've know, you got to be very fearful of sin. It's a terrible thing. And you know you got to control yourself. You just just can't mark. You know, put your hand around everybody. You go, Who knows? Maybe he's a Russia. This and that. You're withdrawing. Two separate personalities. But then what happened? Yaakov. He blended both personalities. And that's called Tiferes. That's called beautiful. That was somehow Yaakov could have both of them, and it's not a conflict. And that's why you know it says anyone who you know there's a lot to do with Yaakov and Shabbos also. You know, Yaakov, whoever keeps the Shabbos has borders that are endless borders, and that's Yaakov also's endless borders. Somehow, Shabbos is able to take this attribute of love and this attribute of control, which cannot happen together. In Shabbos, you move up, you upgrade them. That, you know, down here on this low level, it looks like, you know, what's love is not fear, and what's fear is not love. On Shabbos, 
they elevate and merge the Dibur Echot, where love and fear is one and there's no conflict in the love and fear which is a very difficult concept to understand which will be developed here but you know what, what's our relationship to Hashem there's two mitzvahs in the Torah one is to love Hashem and one is to fear Hashem so can you do them both at the same time it's pretty hard I love you Hashem so since I love you I will put on film I love you, I'll put on tzitzis. I love you, I'll make brachas. I love you, I will not. But I also have fear. Fear. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to make you upset. Those are two different emotions. I, 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 I don't want to... I, I, I distance myself. There's a certain... Yira means a distancing. You know, you can't be too close to the one who you fear. Right? You have, he's the creator. He could destroy you in a minute. He's got ultimate power, so you gotta you gotta uh, sit back a little bit. You gotta watch. You gotta watch out what you what you say to Hashem. You know when when you're when you're in fear of someone, you just can't come over and put your arm around them like that. But on the other hand, you're supposed to love them also. So this is what needs to be worked on. But when you reach higher levels, you can have both at the same time, and that's what Shabbos on Shabbos you're able to do this. All right, that's point number one. That's the Aleph. Okay, point number two. Next section. Nevaradvar. This is all, basically, all I gave you right now was Ramban and the simple um, extension of what the Ramban is saying. Now, the Ramban is a deep mystic, so we first have to understand what he's saying, then we're going to try to understand what he means. At least we understand what he is saying, and that's already a, a step, because you read this Ramban, you, say, you think you, you read it simply, it's okay, you know, love and fear, but no, no, but on Shabbos, they're in one voice. They're together. Love and fear, there's no conflict. Let's explain. But let's preface another statement. We already learned this one. Every day of the week had a partner. And Amr Shabbos, if they had Baruch Hu, the Shabbos said before Hashem, L'chal nasata ben zug. He gave everybody a partner. V'lino nasata ben zug. He didn't give me a partner. Hainu, meaning to say. Diyom echad shabot nivra haor. On the first day, light was created. So who's the partner? Yeshlo ben zug yom dalid. The fourth day of the week is the partner. Because what was created on the fourth day? Shabot nit lo hamaora shuk mar melechas or. Because then the luminaries, the sun and the moon, were suspended in the air. And that finished the work of the first day, which was the light. In other words, a, a, a zug, a pair, means something that finishes the first one. The first one is, let's say, raw power, talent, and the second one, the mate, perfects it. So the first day, there was a powerful light, but it was unrestricted. It had no perfection to it. Came the fourth day, being the, the shidduch, the ben zug, and said, listen, I'm going to take the light, I'm going to make the sun, I'm going to make the moon, oh, now everything's fine. Same thing with the next two days. Beyond Beis, Melech HaSamayim, the second day, God created the water. Beyond Hei, Beruamayim, then he created things that came from the water, like the fish and the fowl, that perfected the water. Yom Gimel, Nivra Evasha, on the third day, dry land. Beyond Vav, Kala Om Demelet, anyone who sat on the land. In other words, on the third day, we had dry land. But what do I need dry land for? On the sixth day, there were animals and people that would walk on the dry land. So that's the culmination of what the dry land's all about. Each had a partner, but Shabbos didn't. What's going to reflect what I, what my power is? What's going to perfect my power? I'm like Kaddish Baruch Hu, Knesses Yisrael, you The congregation of Israel will be your partner. Doesn't mean a Jew. The collective Jewish people will be your partner. That's the message. We have to explain how do the Jewish people in general finish up the work of Shabbos just like the other days finish up the works of their partner. What does that mean? Let's go to the next page. One more point. Besof Memai and Bey stands for what? Ma'asebereshis, at the end of the works of creation, see if it says, at the end of the sixth day, Vayar Hashem is called Asher Asa V'hinei Tov Ma'od. Hashem saw everything he did, and behold, it was very good. 
And the Medrash talks about, what, just say good. What do you mean very good? What's me'od? Just say tov. What's the me'od? Tov, zeyetzer tov. Good is the good inclination. Me'od, very good, zeyetzer hara. That's the evil inclination. Tov, zeyetzer hachayim. Good is the angel of life. Me'od, zeyetzer hachayim. Very good is the angel of death. Difficult, difficult measures to understand. What do you mean? I think anything that that's very bad, not very good. Uperish Agro Gro explains Selashon Baderas El Yahusham in his commentary. Tehara lo asid lavo. In the future, evil yistake will be repaired. The hapach letov and will turn to good. That which we see is bad today will become really good. It's just temporary illusion. In came, therefore, tov, when we say something's good, humash tov ma'asmo. It's something that is in, inherently, and even uh, no matter how we look at it, it's good. But humash betchila lo ya tov. But if something in the beginning was not good, and then it turns into good. That's the very shalhatov of the good. Tosefes alatov, extra. What do you mean ma'od? I mean, very, very good. What do you mean? Well, I got good, I got very good. What's very good? Something on top, the cherry on top of the cake is very good. Good means something that was from the beginning good till the end. It's always good. Ma'od means something that initially was bad but turned into good. And that's the very of good. And he's going to give an example in a minute to explain this. This is the conclusion of the acts of creation. That when the evil was created, that will ultimately be repaired, will eventually be good. That's the end of the creation. Shenivra Latak and Israel was created to, to, to per perfect the bad. Al Kalpanim, what do you see? Chazina. Shabasof Yemeamas at the end of creation. Kfar Nichol Hara, the bad was already incorporated. Bahatov with the good, Venisakin, and was repaired. Shrek Far, but Yomashishi never told Mod, it says in 6 is very good. Let me explain here what's going on over here. There's two concepts. There's a concept of something being in inherently good and always is good. And something that appears to be bad, but that can be fixed, and that too can be good, and that becomes the good on top of the good, which is very good. So when did Hashem say everything was very good? Right at the end of the sixth day. That means there must have been things that were bad, that Hashem made them good by the end of the day. And whatever He did is also reflecting what will be historically true. That historically will be true that there always is this concept towards the end of the week that that which appears to be bad can be transformed into good. And that's the tov mode. And somehow that, uh, that what did we say, Yetzahara is bad. But you know what? I can make him good. I can make him good. Yeah, the Yetzirahara, you know, wants a person to be, to be wild. Passionately involved in sinful activities. Like a wild stallion. What would you say? A wild, a, 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 a colt that just was, that was running wild. Would you say he's a good horse or a bad horse? He's a bad horse. Can't do anything for you. He'll trample over people. Right? Then you got a domesticated horse. Raised in the in the stables, he's always a nice Mr. Ed, you know, nice horse. He's a good horse. But then you got this wild, wild horse. It's a bad horse. But what do you do? You get a professional trainer. He trains that wild horse, and you know what? That wild horse is going to run faster in a controlled fashion than the than the domesticated horse. You will have a, a champion racing horse, but it was a really bad horse. But now that I fixed it up, it's even better. It's even better than the regular horse. The Yetzirah is like that stallion. 
It tells you to run wild. And wild usually to wildly bad places. The rabbis say, where does the power, where does the power for a scholar to come up with novel insights in the Torah? We could be learning Torah. You can learn and get information. And that's wisdom. That's good. God feeds you the information. Read the Torah. But then your mind goes wild. It says, you know, if I know this and I know this and I know that, now I can start saying with this is true, this is that, I can come up with new ideas that come from this, and I can build all kinds of structures of logic that can teach me profound concepts. What part of the human being produces that? It's not the Yetzir Tov, it's the Yetzir Hara. Because the Yetzir Hara is the wild stallion. And you take that information, now you can take that information and do a lot of bad things. If you take it for good, it's nothing better than that. That's the Yetzahara. If you leave it alone, it's going to be bad. But if you work it, it's going to be very good. Death appears to be bad. But really, it's a very, very good thing. You know what? You want to know what's good about death? It makes sure you get things done in your lifetime. Can you imagine if you never would die? You never would die. But let's put it this way. When, when, do pe when are people most productive? Minutes before the deadline. There's an interesting reason why they call it deadline. Let's say you have to break, a company says, we'll take all bids on this project. The deadline is Thursday at 4 o'clock. Why is it called the deadline? Because you bring the bid in at 4.01, it's dead. You got to get the work done by 3.59. Anything later than that, it's done. Finished, you got, it's worthless. First of that every human being has a deadline. It's their day of death means I better make sure I get the work done before that time. Now that's very good, isn't it? Even though dying per se is bad, a person's dying, he can't do any more avodas Hashem. On the one hand, death is bad, it's bad. Once you're dead, you can't do mitzvahs. But by the fact that you know you're going to die, you're going to rush to do all the mitzvahs you can do. And then it's very good. So the same idea here, that God created, he saw everything he created, there was a lot of good things there. But there's also something called very good. And the mayor's saying, you know what's very good? All the things that were bad but are changed to good. That's even better than good. And when did this all happen? Right at the end of creation. Friday afternoon. Ah. So now we can understand what are we supposed to be doing on Friday afternoon? We're supposed to be taking things that are bad and making them good. Isn't that our job? If that's what Hashem did, that's what we have to do. So what is this? Duk Maladavar. Let's give an example. It's a beautiful, beautiful example. There's a halacha that you have to taste the Shabbos food before Shabbos. We talked about it in the previous Shmuz. But now we're going to go and see another insight. We're in the second paragraph on page Yud Gimel. There's a halacha. Now why? So the rabbis tried to figure out why. So if you look in the Torah Sanigle, in the revealed Torah, revealed means just, just what you see, simple. They base it on a Pasuk. The Pasuk says, Tohamel, those who taste it, Chaim Zochu merit life. Which simply means whoever tastes Hashem will taste life. So based on that, so how are we going to taste Hashem? We're going to taste the chulant. We're going to taste the chicken. Whoever tastes it, tastes life. That's what the mystics say. This is the root. This is not so simple. So now, but that's the source. So what does it mean? What does it mean? So the simple meaning is, to know what does it taste like. The person is cooking. No. Does the chulant need more salt or not? Taste it. Ah, oh, so bland. It needs a little more salt. Shh. Taste it. Ah, it's just right. Now, everyone's going to enjoy the Shabbos. You have to enjoy the Shabbos. The food's good. So that's a very practical reason. Oh, Tzarek Tikkun, maybe need something fixed up. That's true on a mundane level. No question about it. Achim Kain ain't said din But that wouldn't be a law for everybody. Who would have to do that? If that was the law, how many Jews have to do that? Let's say you have a house of a mother, a father, six children. Who would have to do the mitzvah? 
based on this reason. Everyone. No. The one who cooks. The cook. It's only one cook. Right? Usually it's the mother, but not always. But, but better than that, whoever cooked that food should taste it. Right? That should be the law. It should only be the person who cooked the food. But no. Elder Mavor, but it's explained there's a mitzvah to taste each and every one of the dishes. Okay? And although it seems that, you know, it, it, it makes sense to taste it well, but, you know, why do I got you know, but you're tasting everything, and it seems not only that, not just the cook, but everybody has to taste it. Why does everybody have to taste it? So, okay, we're not deviating from the simple pshat. The simple pshat means you taste it, so it should taste good for Shabbos. Remember, there's different levels of people's appreciation of Shabbos. Some people who are very simple-minded and superficial, you ask them, what do you like about Shabbos? I like the food. Okay, so it's very important that the cook better cook good food or people are not going to like the Shabbos. That's on a very mundane, superficial level. It's true, but very superficial. But let's take it deep, 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 deep. The move, the who, mipne, de ba'olamenu, shall pisui hara. Remember, this world is a world of pisui. Pisui means seduction. This world seduces you to get into all kinds of trouble. What is seduction? Seduction means showing something, a certain picture, and wanting them to believe that that picture is reality when it really isn't. The most simple idea is when a, is one person seduces another person into a, an immoral relationship. Right, let's analyze what that really means. Let's say you have a, a, whatever, I don't know who to pick on, men or women, it doesn't matter. Right? Let's say you have a man, okay, who is married to a woman, and he's married for many years. And, you know, the marriage has lost a lot of its excitement. And then, but he's a very wealthy man, he does well. And he happens to have a secretary who is not very morally principled. And she'd like to have a piece and she sees how much money he makes. And she'd like to have the finer things in life. So what does she do? She puts on a show. She seduces him. What does it mean? She puts on characteristics that aren't really true. So, oh, you're such a beautiful man. You're so kind. You're the nicest man I ever met blah, 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 to get him to what? To believe that she feels for him. And if he's stupid enough to believe that, he'll fall for that piece of it and get himself in all kinds of trouble. That's what seduction is. Seduction, it's, it's, it's taking something that's superficial and trying to fool the person that that is the reality when indeed that is not the reality. That is seduction. This world... This world is called the Alma de Shikra, the world of lies. You know, the, the word in Hebrew for world is ne Olam, which means Nelam, hidden. The real reality is hidden. It's only the seductions that are out there. So, what is one of the biggest seductions in life? It starts with food. Food is the biggest seduction in life. What do I mean? It's 11 o'clock last night. You should be going to bed. Three meals a day you had. A couple snacks you had. But Epis, Epis, I like to have something good to eat still. And of course, since you're watching a movie, and that takes a few hours, so you need something to keep you uh, busy. Because doing a movie doesn't take a lot of brain power. So what do you do? You open the freezer, and oh man, look at that beautiful Yogan Fruz, a whole tub of Yogan Fruz ice cream. Your favorite flavor, you know, whatever, Rocky Road marshmallow please so that that ice cream says come on you deserve it man but let, let, let's have some fun together you and me just the two of us in front of the TV and what happens you start eating eating has been the greatest destruction of mankind you know they're saying today with the affluence in America obesity is in record breaking proportions People, you know, it, it's, it's the biggest seduction. You eat, you eat, you gain weight, you get fat, get high blood pressure, and die from a heart attack. Good friend that ice cream was. That's what food is the destruction of man. It's the worst enemy of man. Agreed? What do we do for food? We do everything for food. 
And when we eat the food, it makes us not the best people in the world. Food is a big seduction. And really, it's raw. It's bad. What? Yes, it's bad. And let's go further. The Chet Harisham, the very first sin that the very first human being did, involved what? Yochich is the proof. Man ate the forbidden fruit. The first sin came from eating. Right? And the Torah says, you know, lest you eat, you know, and you know, it says a lion only screams from a big full bowl of flesh. When a lion had a good meal, he roars. In other words, the, the more we're well fed, the more pampered we are, the more we have bought into the physicality of this world. There's nothing worse than food. It is an ultimate ra. It is ra. It gets us in more trouble than anything else. Okay. And that was the very first thing. But wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Um, no, on the other hand, <laughs> but if you don't eat, you're going to die. You've got you to gotta watch your soul. So on the one hand, if I just eat, you know, a very healthy breakfast, have my yogurt and an orange, place, and for lunch I have my tuna on a, with salad, and for a snack I have an apple. Sounds very exciting, eh? And then for supper, you have a nice lean piece of white chicken, you know, and, and another a little more salad. And maybe we'll give you a baked potato to splurge, you know, but no butter on it, you know, just a little salt. And then when you're hungry at night, you could have a cup of blueberries. My, oh my, oh man, that's, I can kill for that, right? Can you imagine going to a Pesach Hotel and getting that on your menu? Right? Now, now if you want to live, if you're eating just to live, that's what you'd eat, right? Let's be honest. You don't need more than that. What about that chocolate cream pie? Ah, heart attack, heart attack, stroke. Get away from that. It's going to kill you. You won't eat that kind of food. You'd be out of your mind to eat that food. You know how many, how much poison you're putting into your system with that? Right? But what goes beyond the diet I just gave you? Who's sakanat? It's a danger. The Torah warns us. He shamrulachem. Be careful. Right after the mitzvah. Listen. The Torah says, if you eat, v'achalto, v'savato, uverachto. You will eat, be full, and thank God. That's the source of benching. The next verse says, he shamrulachem. Be careful. Pen unless your heart will be turned to terrible things. When you have a full stomach, you're in spiritual danger. Be careful. So let's think about this. Let's think about what is eating. Is eating a good thing? Yes, only in terms to the fact that you eat just enough to keep you alive. But then that's tov, yeah? So food is tov, yeah? But then there's something called me'od. More food. More food is gluttonizing. That is ra. That is bad. In other words, what we call bad really is coming from good that is now done in a way that's bad. So if you look at eating per se, eating a healthy meal, that's good. Is it very good? It's not very good. It's good. It's good. Now, pressing, that's ma'od. That's a lot. But it's, it's not tov mode. Now it becomes bad. It's taking a tov. Listen carefully. It's taking a tov. Making it mo'od. Making it a lot. In the wrong place. Which now becomes bad. You got it? Now you're having cream puffs. And, and, and all the ice creams. And this and that. Bad, bad, bad. Why? Because it's too much, too much. Bad. Now watch what's going to happen now. The aim can, the ilu, now, so now normally, so normally what do we say? Normally we say, just eat a healthy meal. Eating more than that? What are you doing? Get out of here. It's bad. Don't do it. But what do we do on Erev Shabbos and on Shabbos? Vilu can, but here, yesh din lit om. On Erev Shabbos is a law to taste the food. 
The Ainzes Suda Hani Shekel Chiyuso. You don't need to eat Friday afternoon this food because you already had breakfast and lunch, and you're going to have supper when you come home from shul. Snacking in between meals is not a healthy lifestyle. Having food when you're not hungry. That's a pretty typical North American way of living. You know, when you're hungry, you eat. But what if you're not hungry? You also eat in America and in Canada. No? You know, Matzah Shabbos, right? Matzah Shabbos, uh, on the winter time, right? Your mom is, you ate a big lunch. Your mom is full, right? You're so full, you can't even eat shalashudas, huh? right? But as soon as Shabbos is over, you have to have pizza. Just finished eating two hours ago. I'm, I'm, what do you mean you're not hungry? But I gotta eat pizza. That's bad. You don't eat when you're not hungry, right? You know, you're not, at 11 o'clock at night, you're not hungry. You just I need to do something. So I eat. That's bad. It's the it's the maod of tov that is bad. So what are we? What is this business of eating at five o'clock tomorrow? You're not going to shul no matter how early. Even our many the earliest is six thirty, right? You're not eating supper till 8 o'clock, which is a pretty normal time to eat supper. You've had breakfast, you've had lunch. Now, 4 or 5 o'clock, go over, take some chulin from the chulin pot, a little bit of chulin, a little bit of kishka, a little bit of kugel, a little bit of chicken, a little bit of everything. A little miniature meal. Air showers. Why? I'm not hungry. It's not a good, it's going to spoil my appetite. It's not a meal you should have. And here the rabbis say it's a mitzvah to eat. It's not a meal you need to, to survive on. But the answer is the machole Shabbos, but Shabbos food. Shabbos food does not get a person into bad places, only like it is in the weekday. When you eat food on the weekday, it gets you in trouble. You eat food on Shabbos, it doesn't get you in trouble. Now, that's assuming that you're living in the reality of Shabbos. I'm not going to, I'll be the first to agree, people can mess up their lives on Shabbos with food too. You know, this whole idea says you don't gain weight on food you eat on Shabbos. It's only if you're eating it the way Shabbos is meant to be experienced. If you're fressing on Shabbos, it's not going to help you. But we're saying what happens, Shabbos, you reach a level where you're beyond. There's no evil on Shabbos. You don't, you don't do things on Shabbos. On Shabbos, you have the clarity. Remember we talked about Yediyah and Bechira a couple of weeks ago? We have free will choice. Why? Because the bad, the bad alternatives look to be good. So I have to fight with it. I have to make the right choice. On Shabbos, you see how evil, what the evil is. You don't want to do the evil for the evil anymore. On Shabbos, you're put into the reality that there's only one reason to eat food. To keep you healthy. That's it. On Shabbos, you see the clarity. But, on the other hand, so now what do I do? I say, you know what I'm going to do? Shabbos makes me so holy that not only am I going to eat the food to keep me alive, and it's not going to get me in trouble, I'm going to eat in a way that normally would get me in trouble, and it still won't get me in trouble. I'm going to eat something even though I don't need to eat it, even though I'm not hungry. But I'm eating because Hashem says, I want you to know that on Shabbos, if you see the reality, Nothing. There's no evil at all. And take that, and you're eating it. Why? Because Hashem says, I want you to know how beautiful the Shabbos tastes. I want you to know that your soul is experiencing the, most gr the greatest pleasure imaginable. And I'm trying to create a model, a mashah, a metaphor for what is going on with your neshama. Your neshama, if you are realize it or not, you may not be on the right frequency, your Nisham is going wild. It is tasting. Mm, mm, mm. Wow. Being close to Hashem, it's amazing. Tomel Chaim Sachu. Mamish, the Nisham is tasting. Hashem is so close to Hashem, it's going wild from this great taste. But we don't know this. So you got to do something physically to play it out. What do you do? You have the nicest food on Shabbos. And you say to yourself, if this food tastes so good and it's only food, can you imagine how good the spiritual experience is? But that's the only reason I'm eating this food. It has nothing to do with the fact that I'm hungry or not hungry. As a matter of fact, I'm not even hungry. But I'm still going to eat it. Why? So what am I doing? I'm taking, I'm, I'm eating it that if I did it on a Wednesday, it would be raw. 
On Wednesday, you're only allowed to eat. On Wednesday, can you eat? Yes. But under very strict circumstances. You have to make, on Wednesday is Bechira. Free will choice. On Wednesday, how do I, I, I have to use God's world. So how do I use God's world? On Wednesday, God's saying, this I want you to eat. Healthy breakfast, healthy lunch, healthy supper, no, no junk food. Finished. That's my rock Because that's the only thing you should be eating food for. To keep yourself alive. What does the Yates of Haras say? What are you talking about? Look at the beautiful world God gave you. He didn't make yoga and fruits, you know, just for no reason. He wants some Jewish boys to make a good living. So therefore, go and eat. Eat all the ice cream you want. Tastes good. Hashem loves you. Eat ice cream. Eat this. Eat that. Eat all these things. And eat so much, you'll forget about Hashem. Hashem says, I don't want you to eat that way. You have to be discriminating. You have to make a free will choice. It's a big struggle all week long to be on a diet. The diet Hashem wants. Because there is tov and there is ra. There is good and there is evil. What is evil? What's evil about eating food? It took something that was good but put it in the wrong place. Makes it evil. Taking something good and putting it in the wrong place makes it evil. <laughs> That's what evil is. Evil, by definition, doesn't have any reality. Because God didn't make anything bad. It's just from the good. You could distort it and make it evil. So food, which is meant to keep you healthy, and that's good, when you take that same food to not keep you healthy, you're taking the very same good and making it bad. But now, but, but, but Hashem said, no, 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 the world is tov ma'od. The world is tov ma'od. What does tov ma'od mean? That which was evil can ultimately be good. Even that which we understand as evil can be good. Now, how are you going to do that? How are you going to take the bad of food and make it good? You know what? You're eating food in honor of the Shabbos. You're saying, I'm eating on Arab Shabbos. Remember, Arab Shabbos, when God said that all the evil turns into good. Hashem said everything was tov ma'od. Everything that was evil, our, the job is to turn everything that's bad into good. So you understand what's happening over there? It's incredible what's going on in Erev Shabbos. It's a whole new idea to Erev Shabbos. And if you don't get this idea, you're not going to get the Shabbos. It's that you have to take that which was bad during the week and show that that is very good. So the, the worst bad of everything is food. If you have to look at what's the destruction of the human being from a holy spiritual person to a sinner, it starts with food. Food is the physical pleasure. And that's the beginning of all the pleasures. And the physical pleasure is what finishes a person off. That's where the game is won and lost, in the food. What's so bad if I eat extra food? You eat extra food, you have other tithes. You're exciting your taiva, your, your lusts. The lusts go from food to women to money to stealing to this. It doesn't stop. Expensive vacations you can't afford. All these things, way beyond your needs. But it's, the root is food. Which food essentially is a beautiful thing. Keeps you alive. Can any anything better than keep the human being alive? It's the most beautiful thing in the world. Make a brach on it and acknowledge that Hashem created it for you to stay alive. It's an amazing thing. But there's rye in food. You eat, you get full. Whew! Bad news. Bad news. You're going to forget about God. So what do we do? We tell you, go on Friday, you're not hungry, and if you'd eat this way on Wednesday, you'd be a sinner. If on Wednesday, at 5 o'clock, two hours before, you said, let me eat, let me start gnashing on supper, friend. You're a sinner, you can't wait? You're a pig? Wait, you're not hungry yet? On Friday, at the same time, I'm going to eat it, because Hashem says I should. Hashem says I should take everything that's evil and make it good. And I say the words to Ameha Chaim Zochu. Those who taste Hashem, taste life. I'm eating it now, two hours before Shabbos. Why? Because Hashem wants me to know how good the Shabbos is. And I have nothing to do with me. And, I, and you should taste the good taste. You're supposed to taste a good taste. And if it's missing salt, put salt in it. It should taste good. You know why? Because Shabbos tastes good. You should know the Shabbos is the best tasting thing, the Shabbos Hashem. And to get your little puny mind to get it, make sure that the food that's a symbol of that tastes good. But you're only eating it to get your mind to know that the Shabbos tastes good. So that which you would have done on Wednesday would be an Avera. Now it's Tov Ma'od.
I've taken something that's bad and I'm making it good. It's tov ma'od. That's the avod of Erev Shabbos, eating the, eating the chumot on Erev Shabbos. If you eat it that way, guaranteed. Now, you're going to see now, it all's going to fit in now. So now, now what did you do? You took a part of the week that was bad. And as Shabbos comes, you're taking the bad and making it good. And now you look at that chumot on Shabbos, you say, you know what? This is beautiful food. This food is tov ma'od. It's most beautiful. If you don't do this, then what happens? What happens if you don't do this? They have in certain places, it's mostly in New York, not in Toronto, where they, they get so excited about Cholent, you can go, you know, you can go to gas stations in New York, in Muncie, go for Philip Thursday night, you could also have Cholent. Yeah. In the Jewish gas stations. Now, why wait till Shabbos, have Cholent Thursday night? You go, I said, the guy, when I was in Muncie a couple of years ago, someone showed me, see it's over there, it's right there, fresh cholent, Thursday night. Now that is the opposite of Tom Chaim Zohu, because that's just for the sake of fressing like a pig. 11 o'clock at night, you have no business eating cholent. And they take this beautiful concept and adulterate the concept. It's only when? Friday afternoon, because that's the time to fix up the world. Thursday night, it's the beginning of Yom Shishi, it's not time to fix up the world. Fixing up the world comes right before Shabbos. Right before Shabbos you have the chon. Not because you're hungry Thursday night. Now, it doesn't mean to say, I don't want to cast aspersions. Well, how come Thursday night we give the guys a little chicken wings, a little, 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 little good dishes? That's because you want to reward the people for learning. You know, and there's an aspect of Shalol Lishma. We want people to go out to learn. We want them to learn Torah. They learn Torah. And some guys, Taka, they, to rush to learn Torah, they have to miss supper. Some guys I know, they're working till 8 o'clock. They rush, rush to learn. They're hungry. Okay, so when we're finished, you eat a little chicken wings, have a little good of Esther's good food. And you know, okay, Baruch Hashem. I'm, I'm not that star, but you guys are hungry. But Stamazoi, just stam to pick out late Thursday night just for the heck of it. There's nothing to do with that. So that's what you're supposed to do. Erev Shabbos, let me just finish this one thing. So, so this meal, you don't need this. See, because why? Because when you eat food on Shabbos, it doesn't cause bad things to happen. Yeah, what's the question? Does the children in the cover the food of Shabbos? Everything you'll eat on Shabbos, whatever you made on Shabbos, whatever you're going to eat on Shabbos, it doesn't have to be a big meal. Take one spoon, just one spoon. It doesn't have to take a lot. So you make house. chicken soup and and kneidelach and okay. fish so you take you take a, a fazi okay. you just take a little a little bit of the a touch of the fish not like a, not even a piece just a little bit just a take come okay have a little fish have a little bit of the uh, of the chicken soup have a little bit of the roast it's not going to be enough to fill you up it's not meant to fill you up have a little bit of the chant have a little bit of the kugel a little bit of the dessert now normally we'd say what a pig he's a pig so no this way I'm eating bedafkanat bedafkanat it's to show that no nothing nothing's wrong with the food on Shabbos that's when you you get to a higher now see when you look when you're up here outside of the Mishigas you look down what is food food is the things that connect you to Hashem if you look at it that way you can't get in any trouble from that you can't get in trouble if you know what it, what it is, what the emiss of the food is. But you can't wait till Shabbos. You've got to fix it up before the Shabbos because that's the way God created the world. It was coming by he er, by he boker, yom shishi. No, I'm sorry. It, it, it says, uh, Hashem looked at the whole world. It, did, tov ma'od. it was very good. That's right at the end. Tov ma'od. What's the ma'od? Even the bad was good. It's good what food on Shabbos. Why? To know that Shabbos is good. You're only eating the food as a reflection of what's going on in the Neshama. And then not to overeat. There's never a leniency. So, of course, the food you eat on Shabbos doesn't make you fat. Why? Because on Shabbos you're making the tikkun. During the week we eat like chazer and we overeat and we get fat. On Shabbos you're taking the ra and you're making a tov ma'od. You're taking that beautiful succulent piece of roast, then on a Wednesday you'd eat six pieces of roast and five pieces of kugel and you gain four pounds at that meal. On Shabbos you don't gain food from, meat, uh, weight from the food because you're not eating that much. <laughs> Do you understand? You're just eating it for the taste to know how much Hashem loves you. You don't have to eat that much for that. Therefore that Shabbos food doesn't get you fat. 
people make a mistake. I need 20 helpings of Shabbos who are not get fed. You're going to get plenty fat from that. Let's finish the last paragraph. We'll be done for today. dugma. That's the example. Shekfar lifnei Shabbos. Before the Shabbos. Besof yemei amasa, which is the end of the activity of the week. Tzorech letake nara. You got to repair the evil. And to incorporate it into the greater good. At least a little bit. Why? So that you can now enter into that stage of Shabbos, which is a taste of the world to come. Because in the world to come, there's only good. Shabbos is a taste of that reality. If you're in this world of Shabbos, which is a taste of the world to come, and what is Shabbos? It is totally removed from evil. That's what Shabbos is. So what is Shabbos? If you ask the question, what is the nature of Shabbos? Shabbos is the day where there's no Ra. It's only good. Everything is in a perfect state. That's what Shabbos is. That's different than any other day of the week. The six days of the week, their character is based on Sheker, falseness, illusion, pitui, seduction. That's the six days of the week. Now they all have different versions of that pitui. And they have mates and partners. Shabbos, the nature of Shabbos is reality. Don't Truth, good, connection to Hashem, perfection of the world. That's what Shabbos is. Now, Shabbos is I have no mate. Every day of the week is it was a world of foolishness and seduction and lies. I can't make a shidduch with the other days of the week. Every day of the week looks at chicken as a fresher's uh, fiasco. I look at chicken as eating a little bit to have the strength to live. I can't make a shit with these people. So Shabbos, I've got no match. Hashem says, Knesset Yisrael is your match. The congregation of Israel, they are your match. Why? So Tzarech Adam, now the Jewish person, we got to now go into that Shabbos. We're the sh- you're the shidduch of the Shabbos. We have to be like Shabbos. This is the correction of evil. That's inside the person. We have evil inside of ourselves. We got to fix it up. This is a Shabbos before the Shabbos enters. That's what it means the congregation of Israel is your partner Shabbos. Why? The Knesset Israel, because what does the Jew do, especially on Arab Shabbos? Hamashlimim we make, we perfect. Umasakmin as a Maiserbration, we perfect, we correct and fix up the work of creation. Haim b'nei zugah shal Shabbos, they become the partner of the Shabbos. Hamishlalam as a Maiser, that perfects the days of the week. You see what's going on over here? Shabbos is the day of total perfection. So Shabbos says, I can't make a shidduch the other day. They're not perfect. Hashem says, don't worry. The Knesset is so the congregation of Israel is perfect, makes things perfect. And that's our job. Now really it'd be good if we were perfect all week long, but that's too tough the whole week. The whole week we make a lot of mistakes. We do a lot of errors ourselves. But comes Arab Shabbos, we have to bring it all home. And Arab Shabbos is going to say, look, we're going to take a look at food as example. Food, which is evil, terrible evil, we're going to make it tov mode. We're going to even take a, a juicy cholent that can get you in big trouble during the week. Have a little taste of it to know how beautiful the Shabbos is. And now it's, it's, it's mode, it's beautiful. Man can take the world and make it perfect. And that's the shidduch with Shabbos, which is only perfection. Shabbos is so, so, so high. It's way, way, way high. So its perfection is beyond our appreciation. So, but the Shabbos says, but how about my perfection to be felt below? That's where the man has to come in. The man comes in and takes that which isn't perfect and makes it as perfect as he can. And that's the shidduch. That finishes up the Shabbos. That's what it means that we're the, we're, we're the shidduch with Shabbos. Incredible idea. So that's, so that's what the whole era, of we have to come into Shabbos. The whole week long is the world of Bechira, the world of choice, the world of Pisui. We get challenged, we make mistakes. Or if we do the right thing, we think we're doing it because we're so good, as I said in the Tuesday morning class, I decided to give tzedakah, but you said it was you, it's not Hashem. Comes right before Shabbos, say, no, 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 no. I gotta perfect all this. I gotta perfect all this. And that's why it's very important the rabbis say, most important, to do, to do tshuva on Erev Shabbos. 
What is teshuva? Teshuva, you know, if you do teshuva out of love, then the intentional affairs become mitzvahs. Isn't that tov maod? Let me ask you. Let's see you put on film today. Is it mitzvah? Yeah? It's tov. Okay. How about if you uh, spoke less and hard today? That's pretty bad, yeah? But the Gemara says, if you do tshuva out of love, what happens to the Averis you did? They become mitzvahs. Now, it's not so easy to do tshuva out of love. But if you do a real tshuva out of love, you go over to the person, I'm sorry, I'm never going to do it again. And I'm going to be more careful this. And now I'm going to use my tongue in a beautiful way. And I'm, I see how much I hurt you. And that was terrible. And I see the power of the mouth. And I'm going to use my mouth for only the best things. I'm going out of my way to make people happy. And this and that, all these things. All of a sudden, that of is a mitzvah. That's tov maud. Because you never would have come to that level. Yeah. So that's what you have to do on Arab Shabbos. That's the whole point of Arab Shabbos, to make it tov me'od. Because you're going to the Shabbos. What's the Shabbos? The Shabbos, taking conflicting things and having them live together. Food is the greatest conflict. Well, what's our relationship with food? What do we call it? The love-hate relationship. I love it and I hate it. <laughs> All of us love and hate it. I love what it tastes, and I hate what it does to me. On the one hand, I love it. I love it because it keeps me alive. But I hate it because it turns me into a pig. This is what Ramban is talking about. Ramban says we have positive misses and negative misses. Just look at food. Food itself. Think about this. There's a positive mitzvah to food. Absolutely. What's the positive mitzvah? Eat the food to keep yourself alive. Is that, a, is that not a mitzvah? Torah says, take care of your life. You're eating food, you're hungry. I'm starving, so eat. No, I can't eat, because it's going to make me into a yetzer. But you're going to die. Okay, I have to eat it. I love it. <laughs> but if I love it, I'm going to eat it. If it's going to be bad for me. <laughs> I hate it. Stay away. That's the problem with diets. Right? The first three letters of the word diet. Die. That's really why I call it diet, because you die. You hate it. Uh-huh. You hate the food. Look what this food's doing to me. It's making me uh, overweight. It's giving me high blood pressure. I'm getting sugar. I'm getting diabetes. I hate it, but I can't, but I love it. So what do I do? So, so what's normally, people say, listen, either, either I guess I got to go cold turkey. No more food for me. That's it. I'm not eating. That works for about three days. Then you're dying in bed. Or I guess I got to eat some. We have this trouble. Food makes us nuts. There's no, in, no there's only in a wealthy side, there's so much talk about food. Either they talk about food, how much, you, you look in any magazine. The first 30 pages tell you beautiful, uh, look at these ladies' magazines, right? They give you all these fantastic, scrumptious, you know, chocolate mousse, chocolate this, chocolate that, tomato make it. First, then the second half are all these diet programs. <laughs> now, how about if we don't have either one? You save a lot of money. Don't eat the chocolate cake, you won't have to go on a diet. Look at it, just look, you know, all, all, the, all the food is in the first, look at the next magazine, you know, like Women's Day, face, all these magazines, right? First half is all the yummy food, second half is all the diet plants. So it, look, think about it, food makes you crazy. We, we, there's, a, there's a positive mitzvah to food, to, you should love food. I love food, biggest proof is you make a brach on it. I love food because it's a gift of Hashem to show you how much Hashem loves me. I love Hashem. I love the food. I make a brach and everything's fine if you eat healthy. On the other hand, you're fresh like a pig. You're supposed to hate that. You're supposed to hate food. You're supposed to love food. So what am I supposed to do? I don't know what to do. And during the week, that's the Shomer and Zohar that are not said at the same time. Do you understand? It's not said at the same time. On the one hand, I'm supposed to love food. I'm supposed to hate it. I don't know how to deal with this. I can't deal with it successfully. That's Shabbos. Shomor v'zochor b'dibur echad. Love and fear are said at the same time. When you're in the world of Shabbos, you see, when you're way up there, you don't ascribe negative things to the food anymore. You don't feel that I have to eat the chocolate cake because eating chocolate is good because I love it because I have to satisfy the animal in me. And Shabbos say, what kind of animal? You're not an animal. You're in a neshama. Forget it already. You're in a neshama. What do you need chocolate cake for? What do you need chocolate pie for? And yet, the rabbis say, but you better make one for Shabbos. What? I hate it. No, 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 no. You love it. But I hate it. No, 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 no. You're going to eat it. Why? To show how much how, t- how tasty the Shabbos is. Oh, if you eat it that way, you could hate bad food, but you could love this food, which is normally bad food. 
Do you hear? That's, if you really want to succeed in a diet, throw out all the diet books. I'll give you the answer. Shabbos. If you keep Shabbos the way a from Jew should keep Shabbos, that's the best diet. Because you now, you become a master of yourself. And then you look at the most beautiful foods and say, of course, I love beautiful foods. But I'm going to take at the Shabbos table a little sliver of the chocolate cake, just a very little, just to, oh, tastes amazing. That's all I need. A little sliver of this, a little that. And now I love the food. Why do I love it? Not for the silly reasons that it, the, the good taste goes down and I'm a pig. I love it because it shows how much Hashem loves me. And, I, and, and then again, and of course, the part of the food that's terrible, I hate that part. But that's not the part I deal with. Shomer v'zachar b'dibu rechad. In one mouth, you can love it and yet be cautious about it. And yet enjoy it. See, when you go on a diet, usually the psychology is like this. I'm going on a diet. I've made up now. For the next six months, I will not enjoy life. That's a typical diet. Typical diet is I'm only going to eat foods I don't like. I'm going to eat healthy foods. I'm going to suffer. And life's going to be miserable. And that's my diet. Now, that goes on for a certain period of time. But after a while, you get tired of not enjoying life. And then the diet explodes. You have to come up with a new attitude to a diet. The diet says, I eat from Seichel. From what Hashem tells me to eat. That's how I eat. And when I eat the way Hashem tells me to eat, then I can eat anything in the world with the way, the way Hashem... Because I'm not fooled by what that chocolate cake says. The chocolate cake is not a seductress, a temptress that's going to get me to go into bed with that chocolate cake and fresh the hope that I explode eight pounds overnight. I go and they have a little taste, a little kiss, goodbye. You know, that's why I told you. I said that Friday night. I said it to Tuesday night class. I didn't say it in the day class. You know, is a mitzvah, you know, the Yidin have always eaten kishka, right? What's up is kishka? I mean, if you look at it, it's not a very healthy food. <laughs> you know, but Jews die for kishka. I mean, you got to have kishka in your children, man. Mm -hmm. So, what does the word kishka mean? Well, if you read it in English, it's hard to understand. K-A-S-K-S-K-S-H-K-E, kishka. It's not like, if you understand in Yiddish, it's a beautiful thing. Nah. In Yiddish, how do you say kiss in Yiddish? Kiss, akush, akush. How do you say God's name? yud -hey. yud -hey would normally be yo, but we don't say God's name yo. What do we say and say? We don't say God's name yud -hey. We go ka, ka, ka for Hashem, not yo, ka. So, kish, ka, a kiss from Hashem. And that's why it's called kishka. What do you think, it's Mistam, it's called kishka? It's not called kishka, it's kishka. Uh, kishka is like a Polish word from, the, from a sauerkraut festival in Germany. It's kishka, kushka, a kiss from Hashem. Yeah, because taka tastes good. A piece of kishka tastes good. All that fat and that grieb and all sitting in there, it tastes good. But you, don't, you have a little bit, just the lips. It's a little taste. Not, you don't have six right, pieces of kishka. A taste from Hashem, you know, you can get a kiss from Hashem with one little piece. So if you don't remember anything from the class, just remember the kishka. If you have the kishka and you have it in mind, you say, Tomel Chaim Zachu, those who eat it merit life. Pass the kishka. And you say, and we even just say, even if you just say on Shabbos, pass the kishka, you're doing a mitzvah. Because you're saying, pass me a kiss from Hashem. Hmm? So that, now that's Shomer Vazachar, Bedibur Rechad. That's loving and being afraid at the same time. At the same time. That which you were afraid to, I would never touch kishka on Wednesday. Ugh, it'll kill you. A Shabbos won't kill you. Why? Because I'm just tasting a kiss from Hashem. A t kiss from Hashem is never fattening. Will never get you sick.